Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. It's been described as an atomic bomb in our information ecosystem. Disinformation has been shaping narratives on global pandemics, on armed conflicts and on elections around the world. It's a term that encompasses various tactics, which we'll unpack in this discussion, but all of them are designed to undermine trust in public institutions, in the media, and in the very idea that there are common bonds that bring us all together in our societies. Disinformation is a particular concern to the EU as it holds an EU-wide election in June. Well, for this episode, I'm joined by Delphine Collard, Deputy Spokesperson for the European Parliament here in Brussels. Welcome to you. I'm also joined by Tricia Meyer, Director of the Research Centre for Digitalization, Democracy and Innovation at the Brussels School of Governance. And she's also the Principal Investigator for Edmo Bellux. We'll explain what all of that means in due course. Welcome to you, Tricia. And also, I'm very pleased to welcome Lutz Gullner, Head of Strategic Communications of the European External Action Service. Uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, Delphine Collard, so you've been mapping disinformation across the EU. What conclusions have you come to? Well, ahead of important elections, indeed, we have been looking at elections, uh, national elections that have been uh, happening over the 18 uh, last months, and together with other institutions, together also with fact-checking organisation. What we see is that, of course, none of the national elections are now um, not seeing any episodes of information manipulation or attempts to s increase polarisation or to sow um, this, this uh, just... Um, um, this content about uh, the elections and the way they are. So um, this is a trend that we see. We should ex not exaggerate it, but we should be aware of it and respond, of course. And, and you've launched this uh, uh, toolkit where you meet young people. It's part of an uh, educational campaign, right, to to kind of set the record straight. Um, what's, what's all that Yes, I think we to? know that in the response to disinformation, we don't have a silver bullet. We need a whole of a society approach. <laughs> and it implies also working on resilience, working on resilience of different parts of the society. So at Parliament, together with other institutions, we are really working with teachers, with visitors to the Parliament, with students to provide also uh, information, learn critical thinking, media literacy, and to have it in the form of games and quizzes. But it can also be, um, for example, also um, informing the members of this institution about what they can do. Uh, Trisha Meyer, so that kind of educational aspect is part of your work as well. If you could just briefly explain that in the context of this Edmo Bellux uh, initiative. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so uh, Edmo Bellux stands for the European Digital Media Observatory for Belgium and Luxembourg, and we're part of a network of Edmo hubs. We cover the EU 27. Um, and we have three pillars of trying to raise awareness of disinformation and societal resilience to it uh, as well. And um, media literacy campaigns, but also going into the classrooms and really uh, having students and pupils uh, interact and understand better uh, how to fact check, for instance, but also go into dialogue with each other on contentious and polarizing topics is a, yeah. and an important aspect of that. Face, face to face contact with people is actually important Absolutely. rather than just virtual. Um, I want to bring in uh, Lutz Gullner, and you actually wanted to share some concrete examples of disinformation. Let's, uh, let's just throw that up uh, on our screen. Um, th these are what are known as doppelganger, so carbon copies of what looks like a real website. On the left, we have a French news site, or a copy of that, which says, are there cereals in Ukraine, question mark? And uh, bottom right, we have a headline in German saying it's time for Germans to open their eyes to Ukrainian war crimes. Uh, and then the one in the middle is about a gas explosion in Bremen. Uh, do you want to uh, maybe de debrief these three examples quickly for us? Yeah, I think the point that I would like to make with this example is really to show if we look at disinformation, it's not just a question of a narrative and a counter-narrative. It's not a question only about true and false, but about a, uh, a more holistic an activity which is intentional coordinated and which is very often also using technical means to 
deceive, to mislead. And I think these examples that we are seeing here are part of a broader operation that has been unmasked by a number of actors, mm. civil society, but also uh, governments like the French government that has attributed this specific campaign to an actor, and that is Russia in this case. And it shows how sophisticated also the, the techniques are that are being used, in that case, cloning of websites. So you have a website of, for example, The Guardian or Le Monde or uh, these examples that you see here on the screen. And uh, they are cloned, the URLs are a tiny little bit changed. You cannot see this as a layperson, but the content is different. Mm -hmm. And you become, a, you become implicitly involved in these campaigns mm -hmm. because you start to share, because you're surprised by it. Do you have any, uh, any kind of um, concrete uh, elements on how many people were actually reached by this sort of, um, by these URLs? Mm -hmm. There are different figures, and uh, we shouldn't kind of uh, get worked up on which figure is directly, but uh, we see that hundreds and thousands and millions of people can be reached with this. Mm. This does not mean that millions of people immediately believe what they are seeing, but they can be reached. So there is a risk, there's a potential risk. Mm. And of course, it's the, it's the technique also that we need to, to understand to be able to respond to it. Um, Trisha, you, you've worked on the actual groups of people, the, the kind of personalities or characters, psychologies of people who are vulnerable to this, this sort of campaign. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. So in some of the research that we did within the Edmo Lux context, we had a representative sample of Belgian and Luxembourgish citizens, uh, and we inquired into uh, the exposure to disinformation as well as those who are more prone to believe and engage with. Um, and there were two profiles in particular that stuck out of people who believe uh, disinformation. One is those who've disconnected, um, who distrust politics, uh, public institutions, media, and therefore fact-checking won't reach them. Um, and the other is young people, those who tend to have a very sparse media diet. Uh, so no longer engaging with traditional media uh, and mostly just consuming via social media, that that's also a, really a vulnerability. Mm. So is regulation the answer, um, Delphine Collard, because uh, the Digital Services Act has come into force? Uh, has it had much, much impact, do you think? Well, we know that it's part of the answer. As I said, no silver bullet, but important to go for a whole of a society approach. Meaning legislation, we are much more equipped than we were in 2019. We have the Digital Services Act where the Commission is looking now at a fantastic, uh, uh, make sure, making sure that it can be enforced fully. We will have the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, soon. We have also a better labeling of the online advertisement. And we have had also um, important aspect is the protection of journalists that is being also improved with the uh, European uh, Media Freedom Act or, uh, for example, the uh, anti-slap uh, measures. So yeah. a lot of uh, legislations have been put in place. They have to be fully enforced. The dialogue is there with the platforms. They are fully aware of their obligations and it's important that uh, they are basically uh, called to implement it uh, fully. But it's only part, as I said, uh, importance is also the awareness raising and the response. Uh, I'll come back to Lutz, but, but just briefly, uh, Tricia, on this question of platforms moderating their own content, uh, wh where do we stand? Well, they, they have a whole lot of obligations now, thanks to the EU. Um, I think the, the <laughs> crux is in the enforcement and seeing um, what I find important from a researcher's perspective is that transparency and being able to actually get the data now of how well this works, uh, their own moderation. Yeah. Um, let's say th there was talk of a kind of special anti-fake news agency. Uh, wh what, are, what else is the EEAS actually doing in this regard at the moment? Yeah, I think uh, what we are doing and building is exactly this multifaceted uh, approach to the issue. And it sounds like a, like a commonplace, you know? It's very, very complicated. It's sitting in, in different policy areas. I think the fact that Trisha is with us shows how important it is to think together what governments are doing and what civil society is doing there. But uh, I think three essential elements. 
situational awareness, understanding what's going on. There we are kind of publishing reports, helping to raise this awareness. Number two is societal resilience. So enable society to understand, but also to defend itself. And the third element we just talked about is regulation. And we need to think these three elements together. Otherwise, yeah. we will not be able to tackle the issue. And um, it's, it's been said by various experts that the last 72 hours of an election are the most dangerous. Absolutely. Um, what do you think should be done in terms of the European Parliament election then in, in well, June? Not only what should be done, what we are doing yeah. actually together with Delphine. We have in place a, uh, let's say, a mechanism that allows us, in particular in the, in the last days before the elections, to permanently look and analyse and detect any form of interference. And we have everything ready for the case of. But let me please underline, it's not necessarily happening, you know? Right. We just need to, it's the readiness, it's the preparedness which counts. Just a final point from you about readiness, particularly in the last couple of days before yes. June the 9th. Again, we have done exercises and we are ready for the institutions, that it's really right. important, but also people can know what measures are in place. They can go to the election website that is shared by all institutions, elections.europa.eu, where there is a dedicated section now on securing free and fair election that explains all the measures in place. It's also part of this importance to um, inform the society better. It's part of the good practice we learned from the uh, Scandinavian states and also from the Baltic colleagues. Thank you all so much for this uh, insightful discussion, Delphine Collard, Trisha Meyer and Lutz Gullner. And that's all for this episode of Talking Europe. Thanks for watching it.